Inc. HANA Studio presents Audiobook Ruthless People, written by J.J. McAvoy. Enjoy. Narrated by Joel Frumkin. One. There are four kinds of homicide. Felonious, excusable, justifiable, and praiseworthy. Ambrose Bierce. Liam. So, today was the day. I drank straight from the brandy bottle. Fuck the glass, I was too tired to move. You plan on sharing? Natasha asked as she rubbed her body against mine. Handing her the bottle, I leaned back and watched her pour the liquor down her throat. God, I was going to miss that throat. But that was about it. This is such a sad day. She frowned when I took the bottle back. If only she would leave after our meetings. But there was no point kicking her out right this second. Our meetings were officially over. Otherwise, my mother would demand my balls and my father would hand them up to her. What's this girl's name again? Natasha asked, rolling on top of me. Brushing her blonde hair back from her face, I thought of all the things I'd rather be doing than talking, but restrained myself. Melody Nietzsche Giovanni, I said, taking another swig. She pouted, and it was ugly. Most of her facial expressions were ugly, but I didn't keep her around for her face, or her brain for that matter. Arranged marriages are so 19th century. How can you marry a girl you've never met before? You don't even know what she looks like. What if she's ugly or fat? She asked. It would have been a good point, if not for who my family was and what we did for a living. I've explained this, Natasha. The Giovannis were one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful family in Italy, and most of the West Coast. My father wants an end to the rivalry between the Irish and the Italians. So, even if she is ugly, or fat, or covered in bloody warts, I will do my duty and marry her. Pushing her off me, I rose to my feet. Cedric, my father, had spoken of this marriage for the past twelve years. I was only fifteen and wanted to prove myself, so I was willing to do anything that needed to be done to make the family proud, like a bloody agent. I should have just let Declan marry her, but he had already hacked into his first major Swiss bank account, robbing the Russians blind. Neil was too damn old, and had already found himself the perfect arm candy. Like all sons, we wanted to impress our father. I thought I had no other option, but, like I said, I was a bloody agent. You could just marry me. I'm one quarter Italian. Natasha laughed and rolled around in my bed. I was going to have to burn those sheets, or maybe get a new bed. Not even if hell froze over and my mother was six feet deep, I replied, grabbing a towel. And why not? She yelled, holding the sheets to her chest as if she had any modesty to protect. I looked her dead in the eyes. Because you are a floozy, a manky, a whore, a woman of no importance or brains with nothing to note but a good ass and a deep throat. I walked over to her and kissed the side of her cheek before holding on to her sweet throat. But don't be sad. We all have our roles to play, and you have played yours. Your services will no longer be needed. Letting go of her, I grabbed a few bills from my wallet and threw them in her direction. I am not a prostitute, she held back a sob. I couldn't help but smirk. I hated criers. Yet you're gonna take the money anyway. I headed to the bathroom, and when she didn't reply, I turned back to her one last time. Leg it, babe. And if you think of taking anything other than the money I just gave you, I will not hesitate to kill you, sweet throat or not. And I meant it. I was a Callahan. Our word was law in Chicago and on most of the East Coast. The police didn't even bother with us any more. Here in the bedroom door, open and shut, I smiled to myself before jumping in the shower. 
It would be the last one until I met my future wife. Did she like showers or baths? I didn't care, but not knowing proved that I didn't know anything significant about her other than her birthday. February 13, 1990. And a few other small facts. Everything else her father kept buried. There were no pictures of her anywhere. No social media accounts or driver's license. Nothing. Not even a feckin' receipt with her name on it. She was a ghost. If I didn't know better, I would have thought she didn't exist. It made sense, though. I would do the same if I were to have a daughter. There were some crazy fucks in the world who didn't understand what it meant to be the offspring of a mafia leader. Family was everything. That was the one thing my father had drilled into our heads since we were children. Rule one. You kill for family. You die for family. Because you can't trust anyone else. In my awkward years as a preteen, some older fool had thought it would be funny to push me down a flight of stairs at school. That night, Neil and Declan burned his house down, but not before beating him within an inch of his life. When they came back and told father what they'd done, he gave them the keys to the Porsche and told me to take notes. And take notes I did. Very good notes. That is the reason that I am now my father's right-hand man instead of Neil, despite the fact that he's older. Neil didn't mind, though. He was the muscle, while our cousin Declan was more behind the scenes. It worked perfectly. Rule two. Take no prisoners and have no regrets about it. Stepping out of my bathroom, there they stood. My father, brother and cousin, all dressed in the finest suits money could buy. Did you read the foils I sent you? Or were you too busy with your whore? My father asked, glaring at the foils on my desk. He probably stopped when he saw no pictures. Declan grinned from the door as Neil snickered. As a matter of fact, I did. But I don't give a shit where she went to school or what her favourite colour is. The only thing I needed to know wasn't in that foil. For all I know, Melody Giovanni could look like an Italian horse. Before I could walk to my closet, Cedric stepped in my path, standing just as tall as I. Father, have you forgotten what's at stake here? How? Do not interrupt me, he sneered, then added, You seem to forget that the only way you're going to be head of this family is through marriage. There is nothing there about her I care about. Grabbing hold of my neck, he glared, Pick up the damn folder, son. Pulling out of his grasp, I saw Declan standing by my desk, ready to hand me the folder, while Neil stood just a foot behind, ready to crawl up my father's ass if necessary. I don't need the folder. I fucking read it. Melody Nietzsche Giovanni, age 24, born on February 13 in an unknown Northern California hospital. Only child of Orlando and Avelia Giovanni, who both emigrated from Italy as teens. Her mother died when she was young, and since then, Orlando has all but locked her away in a tower. She was homeschooled for most of her life until she went to a small community college in some nowhere prissy town called Cascadia in Oregon. I'm guessing that's where ice skating and glitter was invented. I waved Declan off before walking to my closet. I wrapped a red toy around my neck while both Declan and Neil snorted at my comment and my father stood waiting for more. Other than that, she's a fucking ghost. No photos, no fingerprints. Just fucking breadcrumbs up and down the west coast while her father killed every rival Italian and Irish family within a hundred mile radius before taking over their streets. By the time we figured out it was them, the west coast was completely cut off to us. None of our production could get in or out without being busted. The son of a bitch. And now they were working their way south, taking over the Mexican cartels. Italians always had to spread their shit and put their name on everything. The first and last time I met Melody, she was skate shooting while her father and I discussed the possibility of this contract in his office. Not once did that dark little head of hers miss 
and she was nine, my father said. Am I supposed to be impressed? Nervous? Elated? Thank God she knows how to shoot skate. She's still a woman like any other. He didn't speak, but walked across the room just as three noisy women began to pound against the door. Liam, hurry up. You have to meet Mr. Giovanni in an hour. My cousin's wife yelled from the other side of the door. There had to be a limit to the boundaries an in-law could cross. If Declan didn't care about her so much and she wasn't family, I'd be tempted to hurt her. Handle your woman, I told him. Neither of them made any sense to me. Declan was quiet, calm, and paler than snow, while Coraline was loud, outgoing, and well. Black? My father was pissed she wasn't Irish for about ten seconds before he realised he had no room to talk, seeing as how my mother was a half-caste. Liam, stop wanking off, Olivia, Neil's ever-so-bold wife, said. All three were now infesting my room. None of you were invited inside. Olivia laughed. We saw your harlot run out of here like a bat out of hell, so we figured you were getting ready. Stepping out, Neil and Declan grinned like mad fools at their wives. If you care about their lives, you will get them away from me. Fast, I said through my teeth. Are you threatening my daughters? My mother asked. Yes, as always, Caroline said, laughing before giving her a hug. Of course, my mother returned it. The traitor. For the love of God, get out! I was going to kill them all. Don't raise your voice at me, young man. My mother's green eyes narrowed, causing Neil to laugh outright. Tell him, ma, uh, he said. I pleaded with her. Those damn eyes of yours, she mumbled, and I knew I had won. Thank fucking Jesus. I think we've all had our fill for now. Let's let the pie get dressed in pace, she said. I would have taken offence to the bye comments, but I just needed him to leave without having to resort to deadly force. Let us know if you need any help getting dressed, sweetheart, she added as they exited. Where the fuck was I going? Prom! I am a grown man, mother. Her green eyes narrowed. Real grown men don't use hookers. At that everyone laughed before closing the door, but I could still hear them. This was another reason I needed to get married. You weren't a real Irish man until you had a wife. Without one, no matter what I did, I would never gain the respect that was owed to me. I would take this Melody Giovanni and form a woman fit to rule at my side. With her family's power added to my own, I would own it all before I was thirty. The thought of that, and what else the future held, got my cock up. Only a small part of me cared if she was attractive or not. Her last name and her loyalty would get me off just fine. Thankfully, from what I was told, she already knew what her family was involved in. I didn't have time to train her on what to expect or why my clothes might be a little bloody sometimes. I straightened my tie before reaching for my gun and placing my brass knuckles in my pocket. Upon opening the door, I found my father waiting. Correction. Hovering. He looked me up and down before nodding in approval. Rule three. Just because you sell drugs for a living isn't an excuse to not dress well. Here are the Giovanni's updated finance and business records, he said before handing me a thick folder as we walked. Him and his damn folders. How did we get these? I said without thinking. And then I answered knowingly, Declan is getting better. He broke through the firewall this morning, while you were inside Miss Breuer. He glared at me. I ended it, I said, once we reached the awaiting cars. My mother smiled, kissing us both on the cheek. Hopefully, otherwise I will have to get involved. He kissed my mother back. Goodbye, dear. We'll be back in the morning. I know the drill. Let me know when you've met her, she said, once Neil and Declan entered their own car. We never used one vehicle. My father and I rode separately, while Declan and Neil rode together. 
I climbed in the back seat of my black Audi and skimmed through the files, knowing that the moment we started to move, he would call. When my phone went off, the driver simply connected it to the car's Bluetooth. Vanished, my father asked me. I couldn't help but smirk. The bastard almost tripled his profits in less than a fucking year. He's also somehow gotten his drugs into Valero territories, Greece, Russia and the damn Philippines. He has networks going through most of Eastern Europe, the little fucker, Declan stated through the radio. Apparently we were on a conference call. We had tried to get our drugs on that side of the world for the last four years, but the Valero guarded it tighter than a daughter on spring break. There are three families stronger than all the rest. The Callahan, the Giovanni, and the fucking Valero. The Valero are nothing but snakes. No, worms, crawling in the dirt, eating their own shit. Most of them are Russian, some German, all thieves, stealing my property and selling it as their own. The man's got fucking horseshoes and a leprechaun up his arse, I said. That's the only way they could have pulled it off without the Valero filling him with bullets. Not to mention their numbers are growing. When I was in Mexico, I saw at least twenty of Giovanni's men guarding underground heron fields, Neil said a bit too excitedly. Fucking underground? Can you believe it? I wouldn't even begin to understand the amount of science shit they need to make that work. Down there, the name Giovanni sends men running and pleading for their lives. Tam it egg chase him, hungry are. We are falling behind, and I do not like to be behind. I will not sit idly by as they surpass us. Do you understand me? My father replied. Liam? I know, I sighed, for the last fucking time. Don't fuck it up. With this marriage, we can steamroll the Valero and anyone else, my father added. Again. Thank God the poor bastard didn't have a son, Declan said. Nothing is final yet, my father replied. Even after Liam marries her, which will take a few days if your mother has her way, they won't just give us everything. It may take months to make sure it's our name that strikes fear into the hearts of men. Liam, can you do this? You are very vain. What if she's not up to your mighty standards? Neil's tone was serious and I wanted to bust a pipe over his face. Piss off! I wasn't going to fuck this up. They should know this by now. Orlando Giovanni's daughter was the key to every door. If she isn't up to par, I'll drink until I can't see straight. Or until I can convince her to see Olivia's plastic surgeon. I was only half joking. Ugly people don't have to stay ugly forever. Fuck you! He snapped. Great! Thanks, Liam! Now he's going to be bitching for the rest of the ride, Declan sighed. Look how much I care. I nodded at the driver who ended our call. I needed a moment, but I couldn't shake the thoughts of the little Giovanni that was about to be part of my life. Taking the ring out of my jacket pocket, I stared at the massive diamond that would seal our fates. She was Italian, which meant Catholic, just like us, and that meant... Roll for no bloody divorce. Let the games begin, I whispered to myself. I was going to make this work or die trying, and if she were anything like the females I'd had in the past, she would be dancing in the palm of my hand, and I couldn't wait. Two. Even in killing men, observe the rose of propriety. Confucius. Melody. Miss Giovanni, we will be landing in half an hour, the flight attendant stammered. Nodding, I simply raised my glass, but the moron was so scared he couldn't even pour the wine right. I narrowed my eyes at the red stains on my new white Armani jacket before glaring at him. I snatched the bottle from his damn hands. I'm so... Don't. Say sorry, I said in a low hiss. You aren't even on the threshold of sorry yet. His eyes widened before taking a step back and backing into Fidel, who already had a gun pointed at the back of his skull. All we really need is the pilot, ma'am, Fidel said simply. 
Stripping off my jacket, I stared at the moron at the end of the nine millimeter. He was young, only a few years older than I was. What would make him take a job as a steward on my jet? A better question would be, who cleared him to be a steward on my fucking jet? Things spoken in here were more sensitive than the damn Watergate tapes. Fidel, how did this fool get on my plane? I asked, only mildly interested, as Monty handed me another file. His sister racked up quite a large debt. I do believe he's trying to pay it off, he said, waiting for me to give the go-ahead. He was so trigger-happy sometimes. Is that why you're here? Your sister is a crack whore? He frowned, swallowing the lump in his throat before speaking again. Crystal meth. It's too early in the morning for blood. I shook my head at Fidel. He sulked for a moment, but did what he was told and lowered his glock. If you want to pay off your sister's debt, it would be wise for you to stay alive and not spill my Romanay Conti or ruin nine hundred dollar jackets, I told him before turning back to the file in front of me. Yes, Miss Giovanni, it'll never happen again. His voice sounded like a dying dog's. I almost pitied his sister. Was he all she had coming to her aid? Count yourself blessed, Nelson Reed. Nine nine seven zero zero four two seven nine. One seven zero five Blue Ridge Road. Fidel said, making sure the moron was aware that we not only knew his name, but his social security number and address. Just because we didn't kill him today didn't mean we wouldn't destroy his life tomorrow. Fidel sighed before taking a seat in front of me. It was a nice jacket. You should have let me kill him. My father wasn't pleased with the bloodstains I left in the last jet, I smirked, lifting a picture of my future husband. Husband. I cringed at the word. I wouldn't deny he was attractive. Highly attractive, in fact. But I would need more than green eyes, dark brown sex hair, and a charming smile. He wasn't very muscular, but he looked fast and strong. His full name is Liam Alec Callahan, age 27. He graduated high school at 15, Dartmouth at 20, Fidel said, sorting through the photos. Let me guess, top of his class, I added, waiting for him to pour more wine in my glass. Fidel did so before nodding. But, of course, nothing less than perfection for the Irish mutt. That doesn't only apply to the schools, but also their fancy half-a-million-dollar suits, luxury cars, vacations, houses, parties, and whores. That got my attention. He uses high-end hookers? It shouldn't surprise me much. All men had their toys. I would have to put an end to it when we were married, but I understood. The marriage contract our father signed twelve years ago stated neither side would tolerate infidelity. It had less to do with romance and more to do with strategic reasoning. Hookers and lovers almost always led to the fall of an empire. The moment you became comfortable with one another, secrets were spilled and information was stolen in the dead of the night. It was just easier to do without it. None that we could find. Instead, he just buys them pretty shiny things like diamond bracelets, expensive purses, or thousand-dollar shoes. They all like their shoes, he said mockingly, sliding over photos of all the women Liam had been with. It was quite a list. At least he would be an experienced lover. Of course, that didn't necessarily mean he was good in bed. Is he clean? If he wasn't, we could buy whatever drug was needed. Ninety percent of everything out there had a cure, with the right credit card. As a damn whistle, Fidel said, almost disappointed. From his current health records, he's healthier than a racehorse, which is surprising with the amount of brandy he drinks. His beverage of choice, Camus Cuvée. He has a damn glass or even a bottle to his lips in every photo. He isn't depressed or alcoholic. He's... Uh, just Irish, I added. They could drink every day from dusk until dawn and still walk a straight line. Exactly. From what I've gathered, he's the brains, and is also highly skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, boxing being a pastime of his, 
It looks like Daddy Dearest has spent most of his time forging him to take his place. Doesn't he have an elder brother? Yes, he does. Meet Neil Aidan Callahan, age 31. Married to Malibu Barbie, a.k.a. Olivia Ann Coleman, age 29, three years ago. He lifted up a photo of the happy couple. Neil was all muscle, with brown hair and hazel eyes, while his wife looked like a life-size Barbie doll. On her wrist was a small tattoo of a Celtic knot in the shape of an oak tree. A Dara knot, I told him as I looked over the lines. Fidel's eyebrows rose. A what? I did not repeat myself, but explained. It means internal fortitude. To remain strong regardless of the circumstances around you. It seems Barbie is not very fond of the world she lives in. Well, she sure likes the money it brings her. She can't bite the hands that give her those nice Jimmy Choo's. Dropping the photo, I waited for him to go on. As for her husband, Neil is also a proud graduate of Dartmouth. By the skin of a teeth, as it happens, Fidel added, and is also a world-class sniper. When he isn't killing people from hundreds of yards away, he's playing baseball. A lot. So the brother is an idiot. Olivia's maiden name is Coleman? I repeated, focusing back on the wife as I took another sip. As in Senator Daniel Coleman. Fidel nodded, lifting up the photo of the man in question. Yes, Senator Daniel Coleman, a right-wing conservative pushing for a smaller government, and I wonder why. Her mother is an active left-wing liberal blogger, which is why they are divorced. The former Mrs. Coleman is now helping the needy children of Africa as the head of the Callahan's Global Youth Charity. Both know about their daughter's new family and approve. I couldn't help but smirk at that. Is it a real charity? Sadly, yes. When they aren't stealing cars for the black market, organizing several murders for hire, or selling heroin, crack, and meth to Susie down the block, they're attending ballets and charity balls to better their community. He shook his head. What about this one? I asked, pointing to the man beside Liam. He had the same green eyes as Liam. However, the man's hair was longer and a lighter shade of brown. I figured the African-American woman next to him had to be his wife. Ah, uh, Declan Alvin Callahan. Why the fuck do all their middle names start with an A? I asked. Fidel looked around to see if he had the answer somewhere in his papers. I didn't need to know, but watching him squirm around was amusing. First-generation Italian, like myself, we looked a lot alike. The same olive skin tone, pitch black hair, and brown eyes. He was my right hand, and in some ways that made him closer than a sibling. Nonetheless, I never wanted him to get too comfortable. No matter how ridiculous my question was, or how pointless it may seem, his job was to get my answer or die trying. It seems to be a tradition started in the 1840s, after the first Callahans came over from Ireland, he said at last. Nodding, I waited for him to continue. Declan Alvin Callahan, age 29, married to Coraline Wilson, age 25. He is the son of Cedric's older brother, who was set up by the Valero family twenty years ago and killed by Chicago PD in the crossfire. Since then, Cedric has raised Declan almost like his own. Coraline, the wife, is the daughter of Adam Wilson, big shot bank owner. From what we can tell, Declan was the one who hacked the system this morning, and is also who stole that twenty-seven million from the Russians a few years back. Most of them still don't know he did it. Those who didn't know were killed off, most likely by Neil. What a lovely family. Coraline, I've seen her face before, I stated, staring at the photo of Declan Callahan's wife. Maybe that's because if Robin Hood and Mother Teresa had a daughter, it would be her. I tried not to smile. 
explain? He left a spread of photos across the table. In each one, Coraline was either feeding the homeless, giving blood, rebuilding homes, and so on. She spends more time giving away all her shit than anyone in the family. Last year alone, she spent almost nine million on charities and performed over two thousand hours of community service. It's like she's guilty, I stated. Giving was normal. Giving to make yourself look like a better person was normal. But this went way beyond that. That might be a problem. Both women seem to love the lifestyle and hate the life. Just great. Lifting the last set of photos, I knew who they were. The world knew. Cedric A. Callahan, who is named after the first Callahan, age 54. His wife, Evelyn Callahan, age 51. They make sure their kids breed well. He stated, placing the file down. Now, Fidel, it's wrong to judge. I grinned. The truth of the matter was that I was slightly impressed, and it took a lot to impress me. I could tell Liam's green eyes came from his mother, while his darker features came from his father. They were all quite good-looking, and from what I could tell, all was God-given, with the exception of Malibu Barbie. It was good, but I could tell she'd had work done. Nevertheless, they all looked tall mark ready. It was almost sickening. Mom, why in the hell is Cedric stepping back and allowing his second son to take over? It makes no sense. I've checked into his health records, and he's fine. I took my time drinking in the warmth of the wine as I stared at the photos. Fidel was right. People like us don't just step down. We didn't retire. We died, and someone tried to replace us. But I think I knew Cedric a little bit better. After all, my father spoke often of him. All I know is he didn't want to lead, but had no other choice after his brother's death. Now he's washing the blood off his hands onto his sons. He frowned, shaking his head at the photo. The Irish and their fucking drama. My father lost his elder brother as well, Fidel. We Italians have drama. Yeah, well, they still need you more than you need them. Are the wives involved in business? I asked, ignoring him. Evelyn looked too sweet to be packing, with her sandy brown hair curled gracefully under a large sun hat. But then again, it was my grandmother who had taught me how to fire my first gun. I was only seven, and I've never been without one since. Fidel huffed. No, they prefer to keep their heads above ground. Planning parties, making sure everyone attends mass on Sundays, going to charities and monthly dinner parties. They all know and accept it with open arms, but they aren't on the same level as you, ma'am. Smirking, I shifted my gaze to him. And what level am I on? Fidel adjusted his tie before sitting straighter, his face void of all emotion, eyes almost black. You, ma'am, are ruthless, and not a soul on this planet would dare cross you. You would put a bullet in our heads if we were ever disloyal to you or the family. You are the boss, he replied. When I glanced at the men surrounding me, they nodded, not making eye contact, but aware that I was looking. It made me proud. It had taken a lot of blood, sweat, and no tears to make sure that they and everyone else knew that I was the boss. I may be pretty, I may be young, but I was also a Giovanni. Giovannis were, and always would be, beautiful yet lethal when crossed. Nodding, I leaned back in my seat, finishing my wine as we descended. I was the head of the Giovanni Empire now, a fact that no one other than my men and my father were aware of. The world still believed he was the boss, but since the age of eighteen, everything, the drugs, the hits, the money, had been run through me, because my father was dying. The great Orlando Iron Hands Giovanni was dying of stage four colon cancer. Ninety percent of everything out there had a cure, if you had the right credit card. Cancer, however, was a self-righteous bitch that fell into the ten percent that couldn't be bought. The irony was that most people in our world thought that sons were the only way to keep our underground empire growing. 
My father didn't. He felt he was blessed. The men in our family all seemed to die of the same cancer, but the women were made of tougher stuff. My grandmother lived until she was a hundred and four before she passed away in her sleep with a gun under a pillow. My mother died in a plane crash. I was six when I figured out what my family was. I was brighter than most kids my age, and at seven years old I was learning to shoot my first gun. By eleven I was being homeschooled in college algebra, drug cartels, and, at my father's insistence, hand-to-hand -hand combat. By seventeen I knew the business like the back of my hand. Fidel was right. I would put a bullet in his head in the blink of an eye if he gave me a reason. And I liked Fidel. Mrs. Giovanni, we are now in Chicago, the pilot informed me as I rose from my seat. Monty, my bodyguard and third in command, opened the plane door and stepped out first, followed by two other men carrying my things. The moron, Nelson, stood at the front of the plane trying his best not to make eye contact with any of us as we reached him. Have a good day, Miss Giovanni. As I handed him my jacket, he stared at me wide-eyed. Take it to your sister and let her know how close you came to dying today. And while you're at it, go find your balls before I see you again. With that, I walked out and found a shiny black limo waiting for me. Stopping next to Monty, I tried not to roll my eyes. Where am I going? Prom? Monty, see if you can get me a car in white. And soon, I sighed, I did not want to be driven. I wanted to drive. I needed to drive. It was one of my four S's. Swimming, shooting, sex, and speed were the only things that could help clear my mind. Yes, ma'am, he said, pulling out his phone and already speaking to someone. If Fidel was my right hand, then Monty was my left. He was never taken by surprise. He didn't need to be acknowledged or even seen and only spoke when necessary. Unlike Fidel and me, he was the only half-Italian. His blonde hair made him stick out like Donatella Versace at Walmart. His fix? He just shaved most of it off. Fidel stood beside me and handed me my personal phone. There was only one person who had the number. Ciao, padre. Calling to make sure I got on the plane? I asked while Monty and Fidel arranged for a new car. He laughed before coughing. Il mia bambina dolce, I would never doubt you. After all, you were the one who renewed the contract. The contract stated I would willingly marry Liam Alec Callahan, and therefore merge our families. Orlando and Cedric had signed the contract nine years ago when they first created it. Then it needed to be signed by Liam and me on our eighteenth birthdays, and would be signed one last time during the first year of marriage. I did. Has he? I asked, just as a white Aston Martin pulled up in front of me. Smirking, I turned toward Monty and Fidel and nodded. That was much better. No, not yet. But he, his father and brothers, will be arriving any moment to do so. He practically coughed up a lung, but I was used to it. Taking the keys from Monty, I slid in and pointed for him to get in, too. He'd done well. He could ride alongside me. So I am guessing that means he hasn't seen the change yet. This was going to be interesting. You mean where you demand to be kept informed and in agreement with his future decisions involving the business? Orlando laughed. It will be quite interesting to see his reaction. This isn't a normal position wives play. I snorted, pressing my foot on the gas as a row of black sedans followed behind me while I pulled out of the airport. It's non-negotiable. If he wants a stake in my empire, then I need to make sure that he doesn't destroy it. His brother hacked into our records this morning. They're aware of how much we're worth. He's going to sign, and he's going to accept that I'm not normal. I don't expect normal. I said, flying down the back roads that would lead to our Chicago home, despite the fact that we never spend any time in Chicago. Now I was stuck here. You allowed them to hack into our records? I couldn't help but smile. Monty looked at me while shaking his head, but chuckled as well. He knew what I was talking about, even if he couldn't hear the whole conversation. Declan was good. Great, even. He was one of three people who could crack my level one firewalls. 
The second was dead, and the third was me. If Callahan didn't accept, which would make him an idiot, then I would have Declan buried right next to number two. I hated hackers who were against me. My dear, if you were not my daughter, I would fear you. I could hear the smile in his voice over the phone. It's because I am your daughter that you should fear me. In his day, Orlando could make grown men cry and beg for a bullet. If Orlando got his hands on them, pain was guaranteed. You are one of the best that has ever been, but don't count Liam Callahan out. It may surprise you, but he is just as, if not more, ruthless than you. He was right. Liam Callahan was a name many feared. He was known as the Boogeyman of the East. And I was the unknown Wicked Witch of the West. Ma'am. Monty cleared his throat, holding my work phone. I will see you soon. Adieu. I said to my father before hanging up. Monty placed the phone on Bluetooth. Make my motherfucking day, I said, breaking the speed limit as I turned the corner. With pleasure, ma'am. Fidel replied. Ryan Ross. Amory Valero's right-hand man fucked up big and drove drunk. Guess who picked him up? Fidel? I said, my tone laced with anger. He knew better than to ever play guess-who games with me. As luck would have it, Brooks was the one who pulled him over, and he brought him to us. He's waiting in the room under the house, so drugged up he can't see straight. But he's still not talking. Goodbye, Fidel, I said as Monty ended the call. I couldn't help but smirk. Motherfucking day made, ma'am. I just nodded, driving closer and closer to my future husband, my empire, and some new intel. Yes, Monty. Motherfucking day made. Three. Murder is born of love. And love attains the greatest intensity in murder. Octave Mirbeau. Liam. Someone is just a tad bit presumptuous. Declan snickered into the phone. She's already packed, Liam. And sure enough, when my car pulled up to the Italian-style mansion, I watched as some of Giovanni's men placed suitcases, what I figured were Methody's things into a white suburban near the far side of the house. When they noticed us, they finished as fast as they could and disappeared behind the tree sculptures that lined the back. They were all the size of Neil, and I couldn't help but wonder how they would fit in with our people. This would be the biggest merger the Mafia world had ever seen. The Irish and the Italian were like the English and the French. We'd been fighting for generations. She's just like the rest of them. I said into the Bluetooth. In love with Daddy's credit card. But from the looks of it, she's no worse than Caroline. Or your mother, Declan said as the cars came to a stop. He couldn't deny his wife was a savage when it came to spending money. She held on to her plastic card with the jaws of life, and Declan, being the whipped bastard he was, couldn't bring himself to stop her. It would have been great if she actually spent the money on herself or the family, but no. She had to sprinkle it throughout the whole city, drawing unneeded attention at times. Neil's wife, Olivia, was the complete opposite. She'd walk right past a starving child and buy herself another pair of shoes. I, just like the rest of them, would have to allow Melody to shop herself crazy as long as I got what I needed. Hanging up, I tried to resist the urge to grin like a fool. Just from getting out of my Audi... I could feel the tides turn in my favour. Liam, my father said, stepping in line beside me. You take the lead on this. I'll not interfere with whatever happens from this moment on. If you do this, you will have successfully cleared all obstacles in our way, and I will allow you to take my place as Cana Canerta. However, until that contract is signed, they are still the enemy. Should you fail... Seek comfort in your mother, for you won't find any in me. I wouldn't fucking think of it, I thought bitterly. Outwardly, I nodded and put my business face on. Declan and Neil mimicked my expression. 
we had talked about the different scenarios this could come down to and we were prepared for them all neil had four of his snipers outside and declan had jammed all frequencies that were not our own we also had a car position less than a block away with men just waiting for the chance to clip the giovanni's wings they were the enemy until the contract declared otherwise i was more than ready to get the paper signed and continue my blood ascension to cana canerta incoming neil declared from my left the doors to the mansion opened revealing an older jaded looking man with a scar that ran from his forehead to his chin welcome callahans to the giovanni villa mr giovanni is already waiting and told me to skip the formalities for the time being i shall escort you to his office the older man bowed as though he had come out of downton fucking abbey i knew declan would have a laugh about that later but for now we were working i nodded not wanting to waste time with formalities either we all knew why we were here and there was no need to bullshit usually my father walked ahead of us but since i was point man today i followed the old man in sight first the house was beautiful rich and very fucking italian with vintage ceramic toils one too many statues and the overwhelming scent of roses it felt more like a museum of ancient rome than a home finally the old man stopped not bothering to knock before opening a door for us stepping in for the first time in my twenty-seven years i was shocked it didn't show on my face but internally i was shocked if it isn't my favorite irish crime family orlando said coffin and in a wheelchair the man known as iron hands was gone the giovanni study was filled with ancient scrolls floor to ceiling walls of books with the exception of one large window and nineteenth-century handcrafted furniture however nothing was more priceless than the sight of this old crippled man his hairless face broke out into a smirk cedric you trained them well they didn't even flinch i'm insulted that you're just figuring this out now my father said and with a sidelong glance i could tell what he was thinking he was as shocked as we were he just hit it well in the mafia world orlando iron hand giovanni was the stuff of legends the things he had done could not be said aloud without making many people sick or causing them to piss themselves in fear he was one of the very few men my father respected and in some ways dreaded they both had a healthy fear of each other but the man in front of me looked like he hadn't been in the same room as iron hands for years this explained why he wanted this merger finalized i thought please have a seat the contract is on the desk he said to us i knew my family wouldn't make a move only the king of Canarsa was able to sit down with the enemy so i unbuttoned my jacket as the rest of them flanked the sides of my chair we've already read the contract we simply wish to see your daughter sign it i told him in fact i'd read it so many damn times i knew it line by fucking line read it again she has already signed he said through a barking cough tempted to lose my cool i glared at declan telling him with my eyes to read it he could read just as fast as i could and i didn't want orlando to see me bend to his games i would play nice for now but i was not above beating a man in a wheelchair liam declan snapped handed me back the paper it took me a moment to read over the two lines that had been changed you're kidding i snickered handing it up to neil and my father you're asking that she basically babysit how i run my company orlando's brown eyes narrowed the fact that he no longer had eyebrows only made him look more ill we prefer the term empire he stated of course you do fucking italians and their empires orlando and i will call you orlando not out of disrespect but because i know that by the end of tonight i will have a ring on your daughter's finger your daughter will want for nothing she will be able to buy the sun twice over if she wants 
She will be taken care of and treated like every other Callahan woman, which is like bloody royalty. In my care, your empire will be treated with the same care and reverence. Orlando leered before crossing his weak arms. Pretty words, boy, and I will call you boy because even if you were royalty, you would still never be good enough for my daughter. I did not ask her to babysit you. Melody is smart and will be more than useful. I have no doubt that the Empire will be just fine, as your brother saw when he hacked our records. Out of the corner of my eye I saw Declan stiffen beside me. No one ever knew he hacked into their files. It was then that I realized we had been set up. Orlando wanted us to see how much we would lose if we didn't give in. Orlando, don't try to sweet-talk me. I'm Italian. We wrote the book on it. So, take the deal or walk away. That's my only offer. And in case you haven't noticed, I don't have time to waste. The old motherfucker cut me off. I slid my left hand down and felt the brass knuckles in the pocket of my pants. I wanted to bash his face in. The vein at the side of my neck pulsed thickly, as it always did when I became bloodthirsty. My vision began to cloud over with rage. I knew, without a doubt, my father was waiting to see what I would do. Whatever choice I made, he would back me up here and bitch at me at home. I would not let anyone show me up, much less an old-timer halfway to his grave already. Not here, not now, and not ever. The room was silent as I stood up, walked over to his stacked bar and poured myself a glass of brandy. He wanted to play hardball. So could I. How much does she even know about the company? Excuse me, empire, as you people call it. I asked him as I poured. Enough. Leering, I turned back to him. Enough. That's all you can give me. Orlando, meet me halfway here. You and I both know she may be smart, but no father would ever allow his little princess to say the things we say or do the things we do. She's a quick learner. Considering the women you've been with, is that not enough? He had a point. Turning to my brother, I drank some more before leaning on Orlando's desk. It would be mine soon enough. Nail, dear brother, what do you think? I asked, taking Orlando's pen and pointing it at him. As long as she fulfills her other duties, why not? Anything she doesn't know, you can teach her. It may help bind you both together. I almost wanted to applaud him. I laughed at the thought. Sometimes Neil was just so wise. And Declan, dear cousin, what do you think about this rude last-minute shift in the contract? Declan grinned. Worse comes to worse, you have to waste five minutes explaining things to her. Plus, I kind of like the idea. Maybe if the women knew how hard it was to make a few million, they wouldn't spend it so quickly. We all laughed and turned to Orlando, who smirked at me with those damn chapped lips of his. I wasn't sure if it was because he agreed, or because all the cancer drugs were messing with his brain. Orlando Giovanni was harder to read than most. Well then, Orlando, I do believe I'll be marrying your daughter. I said, with no emotion in my voice. Declan handed me the contract again. Before the pen touched the paper, I stared at the meticulous script that spelled out Melody Nietzsche Giovanni. I wanted to see her first, but I signed anyway. My father had always told me to pick my battles so I could have enough energy to survive the war. There was too much riding on this for me to refuse just because I would have to get an okay from a little princess. Besides, once we were married, I would keep her too busy to care. You aren't going to seek counsel from your father? Orlando asked as I signed away my soul. His bride, his choice, my father said, speaking for the first time and with just as much emotion as I had. None. My choice it is, I repeated, handing the sickly man, my future father-in-law, the papers. We shook hands and I tried to force myself not to snap his in half. 
I would like to see whom I have chosen. But, of course, he said, ringing a bell that echoed throughout the room. Finishing the last of his horrible brandy, I waited. When the door opened, I felt my cock try to detach itself. The girl who walked in was an ugly duckling with thick and messy dark brown hair, dark glasses and goddamn braces. Fuck it all to the seven levels of hell, my mind screamed. Just think underground heroin fields. When would you like that plastic surgeon's number? Neil murmured beside me. I could hear the laughter being held back in his voice. He cared about those damn heroin fields so much you would think he did fucking heroin himself. Miss Bianchi, where is my daughter? Orlando asked, and my blood pressure dropped while my cock rose in hope. I could have sworn I heard the old man snicker. Closest fucking call of your life, Declan uttered as we waited for the ugly duckling's reply. The timid girl glanced at us but did not answer. Instead, she kept her eyes glued to the floor. If she didn't speak up soon, I would twist her ugly little head off. It's fine, Adrian. The man before you is Melody's fiancé. You may speak freely, Orlando told her, while I was losing my goddamn patience. Byron at us first, she rose and gave me her full attention, standing with so much pride it almost distracted from her appearance. Almost. Good morning, sir. The boss is in a meeting in the basement, she said, making us all phrase. Everyone in our world knew that fucking word. Is this some sort of joke? Who do you think has been running things while I die, gentlemen? He snickered before turning away from us. If you don't believe me, you're free to go to the basement. But be forewarned, you won't meet a woman who needs to be taught anything. Benvenuti nella familia, Callahan's. Flaming, I turned back to my father who was still staring at the sick man in the chair. Did you know this? I glared at him, only to have him glare right back. Most days I knew my place under my father, but the tides were shifting. I was rising, and I needed to know if he had withheld information from me. No, Liam, I was not aware. It seems to have been a well-kept secret, but does explain the recent growth of the Giovanni Empire, he replied, seeming somewhat baffled at the thought of it as well. No fucking way a girl's been behind all this, Neil said, like a child. Take us to her then, I commanded the girl, and she nodded. I would see this melody and find out if she truly really was the boss they had dared to call her. Cedric, may I share words with you for a moment? My father nodded, no longer caring what I chose to do. One last time I turned to Orlando, who didn't even bother looking back as we left. It must have been a grim day for him. He would lose a company and a daughter. I didn't pity him, though. He'd be dead soon enough. The ugly duckling didn't speak or even bother breathing until we reached the end of a hall that was guarded by two of Giovanni's men. From the corner of my eye, I saw both Declan and Neil slowly reach for their guns. In Declan's left hand, his cell phone was ready to call in more guns if this was a trick. But my instincts and common sense told me that Orlando really was dying, and that he wanted to marry off his daughter first. What I didn't know was what to believe about said daughter. Sir? The man glanced at me before opening the door, only to reveal an elevator with Fidel Morris inside. He was the bastard son of Gino Morris, one of the fucking mutts who had the balls to break into our safe house and kill fifteen of our men sixteen years ago. It was the reason my father pushed for this goddamn contract. This is as far as I can go, sir. It was a pleasure to be of service. Adriana said to us, giving me a short bow again before stepping back. Mr. Callahan, the mutt said with forced respect, making space for us in the elevator. The moment we were all inside, Neil took a step next to him, clearly itching for an excuse to pull the trigger. He knew Neil was there but did not say a word, or even flinch when Declan reloaded loudly. All any of us could hear when we stepped out of the elevator was a man gasping for air as water splashed around him. We were a level up from where they were waterboarding the man. 
The basement was just one giant gem with a boxing ring in the corner. They had cleared everything on the ground floor to make room for their prisoner. As I stepped up to the rail, a few eyes fell on me. The man gave me a short nod as if they understood the shift happening within their company. Each one of them looked just as deadly as our men, and they all stood silently, allowing the man's underwater screams to echo around the space. Enough! A gentle voice called out, and each man stood straighter when the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen stepped forward. Even from where I stood I could tell she was perfection. From her dark wavy black hair, flawless olive skin and deep brown eyes, to her perfect hourglass figure. The knee-length white dress she wore hugged each one of her toned curves and, God, her tight ass, fuck. Her lips demanded to be kissed, and my cock demanded I have my way with her right then and there. Melo di Nietzsche Giovanni, head of the Giovanni family, and the boss, Fidel, informed us. Neil stepped up to see the goddess below. Holy shit, cock motherfucking damn, he said, with his mouth dropping open. Neil, I said without emotion. The last thing I wanted the Italians to believe was that we were impressed. Nodding, Neil returned to the same cold monster I needed at my side. Declan met my gaze, telling me he was on the same wavelength as Neil. If it weren't for the obnoxiously loud gasping coming from the man below us, all three of us would have forgotten he was there. But when I looked closer, I realized who it was they were waterboarding. Ryan Ross? How the fuck did they get him? Ryan, as much as I would like to draw this out, I am late for a meeting with my fiancé, and I hate being late, Melody stated, as a blond man stepped forward holding her jewellery on a white fucking pillow. To hell with you and your fiancé, you no good Italian cunt bitch! Before he could finish, one of the men who had held him down smashed his fist several times into Ryan's face. It's boss or Miss Giovanni? The man said, spitting on him. Nothing more, nothing less. Melody frowned, and even that made me hard. She had beautiful lips. I didn't want to do this, she said, putting her earrings in before being handed a gun. Spitting the blood from his mouth, Ryan smiled. Do it. I'd rather die than talk to you, bitch. Who said this was for you? Melody smiled back as two men dragged the sobbing female forward and placed her on a chair in front of the scum. Ryan's eyes widened as he looked at her. The Valero don't know about your special friend, do they? They aren't big on you fucking women outside of the ones they offer you. You tried really hard to keep her a secret, she said, walking behind him. It made my blood boil at how close she was to him. Did you know she was pregnant? Melody asked causing the girl to hold on to her flat stomach and sob even louder. Two lives saved, if you just tell me what I want to know. She loaded the gun. He didn't say a word even as the girl begged him. So this is your answer then, Ryan? Melody asked slowly. I will kill her. He still did not speak. Sighing, she fired not once. Not twice, but repeatedly, only stopping when the girl's lifeless body fell from the chair. She didn't even flinch. Instead, she walked toward the girl and emptied the rest of her clip into the body. When she was done, she turned back to the now blood-spattered Ryan, who sat wide-eyed and shaken. This must have happened often, because her men went to work carrying the body and cleaning up the blood on the ground, which hadn't touched her. They brought a new blood-free chair for her to sit on and handed her a pair of heels, all of which happened in a matter of seconds. They moved like the military. Does it make me a hypocrite if I still consider myself pro-life? She didn't even blink as she stepped into her white shoes. She's just as fucking merciless as you are, Neil uttered in disbelief. In a single moment, though, she had gone against everything I ever believed. This was not the role I wanted my future wife to play. She was too beautiful for the blood and the darkness. She should be upstairs flipping through catalogues and painting her pretty little nails or waiting in our bed for me to have her. This could not stand, 
and this would not be her role. I was to become the boss and the cane of Canerta. She was to stand at my side so the Italians would fall in line. Not that I could deny how sexy I found it. My mind hated this, saw the danger in this, but my body lusted after it painfully. My cock throbbed for her. Declan snickered to my right. Right now you wish the biggest thing you had to deal with was a charity junkie for a wife. I couldn't agree more. I would have to fix this situation, and fast. Everyone out! I roared, making every last one of the inhabitants of the room look back at me as though I'd lost my mind. The eyes that shined with the most rage were those of my beautiful soon-to-be wife. Oh well, this would be her first lesson. There was one boss. Only one, Cana Canerta. And it was not her. For every murder turns on a bright hot light, and a lot of people have to walk out of the shadows, Albert Maltz. Orlando, thank you for lying to him. I know it's not your forte. I coughed. I was always bloody coughing. I wanted nothing more than to rip my damn throat from my neck. Yes, well... Cedric said, handing me a glass of brandy. One day he may thank me for keeping the identity of your daughter secret. With the shaky hands I held on to the glass before tossing the contents down my throat. It helped the hacking this damn cancer caused, but not by much. She's your daughter now. I hated saying it. I couldn't even meet his gaze. I just stared at the empty glass. My own hands looked so foreign to me. When had I become this man, this broken and tired old man who was frustrated at watching the sun come up in the morning and seeing the moon fill the night sky? When had I become tired of living? In my youth, all I did was live. Some say a little too much, but I knew this was to be my future. Even now, it wasn't enough. I wanted to live more. I wanted more. It was the curse of being a Giovanni. We wanted it all, even if we didn't know it yet. I rode like lightning and... Orlando! Snapping out of my trance, I stared at the gracefully graying man before me with a slight envy. Even now he didn't look a day over thirty-something. The callow hands, I swear, had found the fountain of youth. My apologies. What did you say? I frowned, trying to sit up, but my body was my prison, and I couldn't. Walking over to me, Cedric slowly lifted me up with one hand. I said she would forever be your daughter. I wish to know why you didn't tell me about the cancer. I wouldn't have used it against you. Liar. He couldn't help himself. A small grin spread across his face. I didn't wish for anyone to know, male included, but that damn girl was too bloody smart for her own good, and blackmailed the doctors into telling her. Sneakering, I grabbed the bottle off of my desk, spilling a few drops on my hands. Cedric nodded, staring out the window as he drank. When I first found out about her, I was shocked and angry that she would allow your daughter to get tied into the life we have chosen. I had to see it with my own eyes. Watching her chop off two men's hands down in Mexico sure did the trick. So you saw her on a good day. His eyebrows rose. All I could do was a snort. I didn't allow Mel to do anything. She doesn't ask for permission. She takes what she wants. By the time you figured out what happened, it's too late to stop her. I didn't even realize it when she started taking over. One moment she was helping me balance cocaine and clean guns, the next she was telling me not to worry, because she already knew what to do. I tried to fight her, but the damn girl's plans always worked so well, I was left speechless. Your empire may have needed us once upon a time, but now 
I must admit she's done well. Frighteningly well, in fact. You could have terminated the contract, he said, and he was right. I could have. Any self-respecting boss would never have shared his or her throne with another. And yet here we were. If Mel were a man, no one would dare deny she has the capability to be the best there ever was. But there will always be a fool who thinks she can be run over, and she would never stop fighting. If someone backed her into a corner, she would either fight or tear down at the back wall and attack them from behind. I chuckled. It was one of the things I loved about her. That fire in her eyes reminded me so much of her mother. My son is not just going to let her rule. In fact, I fear the years of peace we've enjoyed inside my house will be on hiatus. Cedric grinned, and I knew he was looking forward to it. Behind his polished accent and his polite demeanor, he enjoyed chaos. I had an old bullet wound in my arm to prove it. But... He turned back to me. That is not your only reason, Orlando. If you minded her fighting, you would have locked her away from it all the moment she was born. The fighting does not bother you. What does? Damn Irish bastard, I thought as I glared at him. The difference between a female and a male boss is that the female sells not only her soul, but her art. Male hasn't felt anything but rage in years. She is walled off and will stay that way if she does not marry. Even if she were to aid him, at least I know she will never be alone. She will still have a family. Everyone she has ever loved has died, and I was well on my way too. In return, Mel died a long time ago. Cedric frowned, shaking his head. It is odd. You believe that Melody needs Liam to end the loneliness, and I believe Liam needs Melody to not fear being alone. He has all the makings of a Cain Canarta. I knew it the first day he was born. Neil was not uh, mentally strong enough. He doesn't have it. But Liam, he was born for it. It's in his DNA. Even as a child, he loved to leave his mark on everything. But I coughed. But behind Liam's facade, he craves to be loved and hates to be alone. He frowned, hating that he had to admit the truth. And that was the truth. He is not as focused as he should be, and he's too compassionate sometimes. I blame his mother for that. And compassion is only for the family, I said. He nodded. He is merciless in many ways. What to be Kay Canarsa? You must not show mercy to anyone but your family. You are cold. You are distant. You enjoy the blood, the death. Liam kills, but he does not relish in it as he should. If he did, the Valero would fear him as they fear you. Or should I say, the woman now acting as you. I must ask you for something, Cedric. I added, wishing more than anything to never have to speak the words that were about to break free from my lips. Whatever it is, say it, and I will have it done, he said, only making the ache in my heart burn more. Swallowing my pride, I nodded. I wish for you to walk Mel down the aisle. There was a pause, and he searched my eyes. Are you sure? I nodded. My bambina dolce deserved to walk down the aisle and be proud. She would argue about how proud she was of me already. How she didn't care that I would cough through the ceremony, or that I needed to be pushed down the aisle, or the fact that more people would be focused on me rather than her. But I cared, and I did not want that. If I went and our enemy saw how weak I was... They would try to use that against her. Against her empire. I will call Evelyn, and she will have everything ready in three days. You can watch from a secret room. No one will see you, he said with a grateful nod. Offering any more than that, he might as well carve out my heart.
Do you not feel like we are Pandora just as she is about to open her box? I grinned at him. They will bring a chaos like we never could, and we did it simply with the hope of bettering them for the future. Cedric chortled before finishing off his brandy. Yes, in a twisted sort of way. We do live in a twisted world, I replied, as the door opened to reveal Adriana once again. Yes. Mr. Giovanni, Mr. Callahan, I am sorry to intrude, but I was told to come get you both. She said with her head down. Why is that? Cedric asked with a coldness in his voice that he hadn't had since our conversation started. The boss and Mr. Callahan apparently cleared the room in the basement so they could be alone and no one was to enter. But a few minutes later, a gun went off. Five. It's a pity you didn't know when you started your game of murder that I was playing too. Rob White. Melody. Who in the fuck is asking to die? I glared towards the back of the room, searching for the face behind the voice that dared interrupt me. My blood boiled. Liam, soon to be fucking dead, Callahan was walking down the stairs. My fucking stairs, with his sex hair high and his green eyes sharper than razor blades. He was beautiful, and I almost regretted the fact that I would have to put a bullet in his head and then smash it through a fucking wall. So, this is the man behind the bitch. Ryan laughed. Before I could even stop myself, I brought the butt of my gun across his face and did not stop smashing it until I heard a sick pop. I beat him into unconsciousness and left him slumped in his chair, his eyes swollen shut. Wiping the blood from my face, I took a deep breath and held the gun up for Monty before I turned back to face the fuckable idiot. You overstep, Callahan. He looked me up and down, with both disgust and lust. Do I? I believe you're mistaken, love. After all, I just signed a very powerful document making all of this mine. Did your father pay for your Dartmouth diploma because you don't seem to be good at reading? I glared at him, trying not to let the thick waves of lust that radiated off of him bother me. That paper says you work with me after our marriage, Callahan, and we are not married yet. So you are still a fucking guest in my fucking house. He smirked, and it was sexy. Dangerously so, and I wanted to kill him for it. Be a good fiancé and tell your pets to leave, or I will put them down, sweetheart. His green eyes assessed me, as though I were his shiny new toy. Do not kill. Do not kill. Melody, stay calm, and do not kill him. I wasn't going to lose my cool in front of my men. Glancing across the room, each of them stood with their hands tensed at their sides, waiting for me to give the word. Just a tip of my head would give them a signal to put as many fucking bullets as possible into the motherfucker in front of me. Monty, Fidel, take Mr. Ross and wake him up. If he doesn't cooperate, please show him the live feed we have of his brother, whom he also failed to hide, and the bomb in his house. I never broke eye contact with Liam. The rest of you... Leave. I could hear their feet as they followed my orders, and ran like roaches in the daylight. The only men who didn't move were the two I recognized as Liam's brother and cousin. That applies to you two as well. They grinned and looked at Liam. He raised an eyebrow at me. They stay here. I took a step forward, stopping when he was a little more than an inch away from me. I could feel his breath on the tip of my nose. I smiled sweetly. Only if they're in body bags, I said, stepping around Liam and scowling at the two men who had yet to leave. You have two seconds. They shifted their eyes toward the man standing behind me once more before heading toward the door. The moment it shut, I spun around, fist flying towards his head. It met his palm. Grabbing my fist, he flung me into the chair Ryan had occupied. He cupped my cheek with one hand and with the other... He held both my wrists tight. First, your joke, he said, panting in my face like a lion eager for the chance to jump his prey. Not funny. Second, he brushed his thumb over my lips. The moment the ink touched that fucking paper, you were mine. Mine to fuck. Mine to fucking command. And mine to put in your fucking place. 
Thord. He kissed me brutally before pulling away. All this is over. You sit at my side and you stay beautiful, like a lady. I stared at him wide-eyed. Is that all, master? He grinned, but before he could speak again, I pulled my head back and smashed it against his fucking nose. His head went back and his grip on me loosened. I brought my knees back just far enough to kick him in the crotch, causing him to release me completely. You fucking... He started, but I didn't let him finish speaking before sideswiping his legs out from under him. With my now ruined white Gucci heels on his neck, I glared down at him. First, I said, pressing into his neck, Get used to this position, because you're my bitch, not the other way around. Second, do not ever put your fucking lips on me without my permission. Before I could get to my third point, he twisted my foot and brought me down to the ground, pinning me there with the weight of his body. Fury burned in his eyes as he breathed roughly through his nose. My mother told me never to hit a woman, but you are pushing my limits. Funny, my father told me the same thing. Would you like me to apologize? I pushed my thumbs to his eyes, forcing his hands to let go of my throat. We fought and struggled on the ground like savage animals before he picked me up and threw me into the nearest wall. I grabbed a chair and smashed it against his side. It went on and on, each of us trying our best to kill the other without actually killing each other. When I landed a kick to his side, he fucking grabbed me like a rag doll and flung me across the room. It was nothing. Instead of letting myself feel the pain, I jumped back up. My heels were now long gone, and the dress I had changed into just to meet him was torn up the sides. His suit jacket had been lost in the heat of the battle. His shirt was ripped and his tie was barely hanging around his neck. His hair was even more disheveled, and his eyes were wilder than the fucking jungle. When my fist collided with his cheek, he drew his gun and aimed it directly at my face. He stalled when he got a good look at me. Panting like the beast he was, the lust in his eyes returned in full force. Without a second thought, he pushed me up against the wall before attacking me with kisses. His mouth was everywhere, from my neck down the front of my chest, back to the sides of my face, before it met mine again. He gripped my ass with one hand and my breast with the other, the one that still held his gun. I felt his hard on pushing against my waist, trying its best to find its way inside me. His actions were barbaric, almost animalistic, like a man dying of thirst, and the only source of water was my skin. I loved every moment of it, but I would not let him win. I would not bow down to him. Not today. Not tomorrow. Not ever. He was so busy trying to figure out how to get the zipper of my dress down that taking the gun from him was like taking candy from a baby, frantically rubbing himself against me even harder, closer. He almost just let me have the firearm. With one great push, I forced his body to separate from mine, which surprisingly missed his warmth already. He stared at me with desperation. I pointed the gun and pulled the trigger, causing his leg to buckle. He stared in shock as the bullet went through his thigh, then roared in pain as he fell down to one knee. That's right. Hail to the boss. Third, if you ever interrupt me again, Liam Alec Callahan, may God have mercy on your soul when I send you to meet him. I kissed him on the cheek and removed the clip from the gun, along with the bullet in the chamber, before walking toward the door. When I opened it, my men were there, with guns drawn on Declan and Neil, who mirrored their poses. It explained why neither of them had come in. They couldn't check the door without putting their backs to the enemy. My men all looked me up and down with proud grins on their faces. What would you uh, like us to do with them, ma'am? One of them, Antonio Franco, asked, grinning wider than the rest of them. Antonio hated the Callahans as much as Fidel did. He wasn't as close to me as Monty or Fidel, but he was as loyal as they came. He and his father had worked for Orlando long before I took over. Getting him to fall in line had meant getting the older ones, the ones who were still bitter that I, a female, a young one at that, was now boss, to fall in line. I turned to my family-in-law and smiled before reaching out to shake their hands. I apologize for not being properly introduced. As you know, I'm Melody Nietzsche Giovanni, but you may call me Mel. They didn't shake back. Instead, they glared, their guns still raised. Oh, right, your brother. I pretended to forget. He is a little beat up and will need a doctor, but don't worry. The shot was clean through and through. He'll be walking in a few hours. 
You may check on him, and I will have Adriana show you to your rooms. I nodded to my men, directing them to drop their weapons. They frowned, but complied before following me towards the elevator. It opened to reveal not only my father, but also the eldest, Mr. Callahan, making me realize once again the Callahans were blessed with almost a little too much pretty for my liking. My father looked me up and down before shaking his head and sighing, while Cedric just stared with no expression on his face. Did my son do this to you? he asked, looking at my slightly bruised arms and legs, cut lips, and messed up hair. It was a small disagreement. I smiled, and I shot him for it. If he weren't my future husband, it would have been worse. I do hope we can be properly introduced later, Mr. Callahan, as I find your past work fascinating. And with that, I stepped into the elevator as it reopened. It was only when the doors were closing that I saw Liam's brother and his cousin rush back into the room to collect him. I withheld my laughter. I'm shocked you didn't shoot him in the kneecap for that shit, ma'am, Antonio said as we made our way up. I smiled. How would I look with a handicapped husband, Antonio? The moment we reached the top floor, I headed straight to my room. I had it conjoined with my father's once he became worse. I almost sighed at the feeling of the soft carpet on my bare feet. This room, my room, was my sanctuary. The day I took over, I had it remodeled to a more 18th-century Roman decor, paintings included. Changing into a white and gold bathing suit, I headed towards the swimming pool. I felt dirty and downright tired, but the last thing I wanted was for the bruises on my skin to linger more than a few hours. The way to avoid that was to take a swim in ice water. It would sting at first, but a few hours later my skin and my mind would be good as new. Clear. God knew it was fucked up now. I could still feel his hands all over me, demanding and possessive. His lips as they bit into my neck, my ear, and at last my lips. He wasn't just a good kisser. He was a sensual kisser. He wanted to make sure, with just one kiss, that I was wet for him and willing to give in. Had I been anyone else, it would have worked. There was no doubt in my mind that he knew what to do and how to do it. He was a force, and I wouldn't have minded if he hadn't come into my house and tried to make me into his little Stepford wife. In the pool I shivered, but I needed to try to escape him. I couldn't, though. He was there pushing his way to the forefront of my mind. I hated him. I loathed him. I lusted after him, and it made me angry with myself. Even in the cold water as I swam, I felt him pressing against me. I felt the electricity of his hands, his sensual tongue. I couldn't deny that I wanted him. I would have to figure out how to have him and at the same time make him understand that I was not surrendering to his will, not even close. It was my choice. It was going to be animalistic and wild and a way for me to wind down. When I finally came back up for air, there he was the object of all my anger, rage, and lust, sitting poolside in a fresh suit with a bandage over his leg, a leg that was resting on my pool chair. Rising out of the water, I reached for my towel, while his eyes raked over my body. See something you like? I asked, squeezing the cold water from my hair. He frowned. Sadly, yes, but it's an illusion. The moment you get close, it turns into a ruthless savage that shoots you in the thigh with your own gun. If I turned into a ruthless savage, it was only because another ruthless savage stepped into my arena. If you came for an apology, look elsewhere. Now, get the fuck up, I said. Glaring, he got up. The moment I sat down, he grabbed my hand, and I saw in his eyes that he felt whatever spark it was that coursed through us. He leaned in, catching my gaze in his own. He stopped just inches from my face before I heard a click near my wrist. Looking down, I saw that he had handcuffed my wrist and ankle to the chair. After that display earlier, I believe you need a time out. He chuckled, kissing my forehead like I was some pet or child. You were swimming so long you missed dinner, so I did you a favor and brought you some. He pointed to the dish that was only attainable with my free hand. I'll come and get you in the morning. What makes you think I can't pick a lock, you son of a bitch? I sneered, pulling on the damn handcuffs. I filled the locks with cement. You can't pick it, love. Believe me, I've used them before. 
he said, brushing the side of my face. If you ever hold a weapon to me again, Melody, I will handcuff you fucking upside down and underwater. He kissed me again, this time on the mouth and with my free hand I slapped him across the fucking face. His head snapped to the side before he turned back to me and winked. Smug, sexy bastard. With his free hand, he slid an obnoxiously large diamond engagement ring onto my finger. He let go, grabbed a few more towels, dropped them over me, and walked towards the exit. Say you're sorry, and I will free you now, love, and then we can start anew. He was trying to break me, the fucker. Fuck you and the Audi you drove up in. Frustrated, he ran his hands through his hair before shaking his head. We will talk later, then. Ace, I wouldn't want to bring you home to my mother, sec. I will make sure the room stays warm. I sent everyone else to bed for the night. Good night, wife. Fuck you, fiancé, I said, leaning back in the chair. I was fine until he turned off the lights and shut the door. He didn't know. No one knew except my father. I had an irrational fear of the dark. Even though there was still the dimmest light from the pool illuminating the small area, I could still feel the fear creeping up my spine. There was no way in hell I was spending the night here. Sighing, I tried to calm myself before pulling the chair and myself to the edge of the water and jumping in. I was going to get out of this tonight, even if I had to break my hand to do so. Hopefully the chair would break against the walls first. Either way, he would not win. Sex Murderers are not monsters. They're men. And that's the most frightening thing about them. Alice Seabold Liam Have I taught you nothing? My father asked, his voice a pitch above a whisper as I read the files on the desk before me. No, father, actually, you've taught me quite a lot. I replied before I took another drink of Orlando's horrible brandy. Why'd you ask? Do not be coy with me, boy. What happened between you and Melody today was unacceptable. You beat your wife. She's not my wife yet, I said, smashing my hand against the oak desk and rising from the chair. This woman... This Melody Giovanni is insane, borderline demented, and she took a swing at me. It escalated, and then she, she shot me through the fucking leg. Cedric glared, his eyes blazing as he stepped forward. As she should have. You had no right to interrupt her. If the tables were reversed, what would you have done? I would have killed the person slowly. You cannot possibly be on her side. You should be on my side. I almost wanted to laugh at the thought. Imagine if it had been Ma, or Caroline, or Olivia. What would you have said to them if you'd seen them act as Melody did? What are you for? I'm on the side of the family, as you should be. It was not your mother, or Caroline, or Olivia. It was Melody. Melody, who will become your wife in less than 72 hours. Make peace with her. 72 hours? Why in the hell are we getting married in three days? So you don't kill each other before the week is out. The press have been notified, and by morning the world will know. Every gossip column, every news outlet, and every damn mafia member in the world will know the Giovannis and the Callahans are one. This means you two will have to pretend so fucking well, you fool even yourselves, that this isn't just some arranged marriage, or so help me God, I will set you both on fire. The fact that my father, Cedric Callahan, had just raised his voice and cursed in the same breath was proof he was serious. He had set a man on fire before. Two, actually. Taking a seat once again, I turned and stared at the roaring fire that lit Orlando's office. This day had not gone how I had planned, and while my bones were aching for sleep, my mind could not stop racing. Son! Do I approve of what Melody does? No, I do not. And that is because of the simple fact that I was raised differently. And by a man much more controlling than myself. The strongest survive, however. And the key to survival is to evolve with your environment. We have made so many strides. No longer are we just uneducated thugs with guns. We have evolved. The Mafia has evolved. And now it's your turn. 
Melody Giovanni is your evolution. Embrace it and make peace. It was only when the door shut after him that I allowed myself to relax. I filled my mouth with the horrible brown liquid in my hands, but even that didn't help my mind drift from the beautiful dark-eyed woman who was to become my wife. Our moment in the basement made my blood boil and other parts of me ache. She did not fight like a woman, but like a trained man, and the way she had looked, like a lioness about to rip apart her prey, made me want her even more. I almost had her on that damned wall, and she had wanted it. I had felt her nipples respond to me as they pressed against my chest through the thin material of her dress. Her eyes were begging, and her lips had parted for me as she held back moans of pleasure. Even her olive skin warmed beneath my hands. I would have taken her against that wall many times over and given her the pleasure we both hungered for. But instead the wench shot me. She fucking shot me. I'd been so shocked and horny that my mind couldn't even compute what had happened. My thigh was burning like fire when she kissed my cheek and walked away. With that one shot she had proven that breaking her was not possible. She would never convert to what I needed her to be. She was a ruthless savage, and if you cannot break a ruthless savage, you need to figure out how to tame them. I needed to make Melody understand that she was not above me. That she did not give the orders. That she did not move mountains or cause tornadoes to rip through the sky. I did. I had worked too long and too hard to let anyone stop me, least of all her. I would have rather died than give up my fucking claim to this family. When I found out what my father did for a living, I saw how people created paths for him as he walked into crowded buildings. I watched as governors, senators, bankers and fucking judges alike kissed his feet. I knew what I wanted to do. Some people like Neil and Declan were simply born into the family. But I knew I was born to rule the Mafia. It was beyond my fucking calling. It was in my blood. It was what pushed me daily and the only person who ever stood in the way of that was my father. I should have taken over on my 21st birthday. I looked forward to that day, but not so I could drink legally. I'd been drinking since I was fifteen. But because I had wanted to hear him say it, I had wanted to hear my father tell the world that I was to take over the company. But instead all he did was give me an island and pat me on the back. His explanation was that, It is not the time. He was the damn king of Canerta. He made the fucking time, and the rest of us followed it. Melody was eighteen and legal at that point, so it wasn't as though he was waiting for her. But each year after that, I waited, killing anyone who dared to get in my way. And now, to have to deal with my wife-to-be, it was fucking bullshit, and I never saw it coming. Today has been interesting, dear cousin, Declan stated, walking in and heading straight for the bar. Forget crack. We Callahans were addicted to brandy and drank it like it was water. Interesting does not even begin to cover what happened today, I said. My fiancé shot me with me own gun. Declan grinned the little fucker before taking a seat on the couch. How did she manage to disarm the greatness that is Liam Callahan? I have seen you draw, load and shoot your gun in three seconds flat. I frowned, knowing that he knew and simply wanted to hear me say it. Sometimes I wished he would go fuck himself. She looks like a sweet little lamb from afar, but when you get close, you find out she's skinned and ate the damn thing just to use it as a coat. She's a beast. I glared at the fire, remembering similar flames in her eyes as she shot me. It was like she had figured out how to make hell reflect in her gaze. I like lamb, Declan said. Shut up, you dick. I threw my glass at his head, but he dodged it allowing it to shatter against the wall. He only laughed. Does this pent-up frustration I feel radiating off you have anything to do with the fact that you want her so badly? That's how she got the gun. You were failing her up, and... And she took it from me and shot me like a dog. Yes, cousin, that's how it happened. I did not want him thinking about her firm ass in my hand or the bullet hole, which was now in my leg. And yet you still want her, you sick fuck. He drank. I don't blame you, though. She is. 
Finish that sentence and it'll be your last one. Cousin or not. Already I was reaching for my loaded gun. Raising his hands, glass still in his left, he nodded with a grin. You are possessive. I wonder what your future wife thinks about that. I don't give a flying fuck what she thinks about it. And what would Caroline have to say about your words over Melody? I asked, knowing full well how pussy-whipped he was. She would be pissed off, so much so that I'd hope she'd shoot me in the thigh. We've never had that kind of far play before. I cringed at the thought of it. And I'm the sick fucker. No more than you, he replied, stretching. Where is the queen, anyway? She wasn't at lunch or dinner. I think I've seen everyone but her since then. Walking over to the bar, I grabbed another glass. Oh, sweet Mary, mother of shit, what did you do? Declan asked, rising from the chair. My mother would have your tongue out for speaking like that, I replied, knocking back a glass before pouring another. Not before taking yours for what happened today. I should have known you would retaliate. Rolling my eyes at him, I walked over to the desk and gathered my files. I handcuffed her to one of the chairs in the pool house and left her some dinner. I'll get her in the morning. You can't be serious, Liam, he said, causing me to turn to him. He should have known better than to doubt me. Okay, you're serious, he frowned. But you can't leave her there all night. If this was how she was with a good night's sleep, imagine how irritated she's going to be in the morning. Do you want her to be like that for your mother? He had a point, but I was fucking pissed. I'm not going to do it. If I released her, it would be as though I was saying she was right. That she was boss. I wasn't going to bow down to her. You hard-headed son of a... Mr. Callahan? Adriana, the ugly duckling, came in already dressed in an ancient nightgown as though she'd just come out of the fucking Middle Ages. Declan held back his laugh by filling his mouth with brandy while I just turned to the poor, time-confused girl in front of me. Yes, ugly... Adriana, I asked. She glared at me as though she knew what I almost said. The boss wanted me to ask what time you'll be departing in the morning. Declan spit out the drink in his mouth, coughing like a dying man before laughing hysterically. I stared at her for a moment before stomping out of the room without answering. I had made sure all her men had been far away. There was no way she should have fucking been able to get out of those cuffs. They were designed by me and made with reinforced steel. Bursting into the indoor pool house, I froze. Oh, my dear cousin. You have met your equal, and it is funny as shit to watch. Declan muttered, standing right beside me as I stared at the broken chair, now resting in its watery grave. It looked as though a monster had ripped its legs and arms off. Seeing as how I only handcuffed her to one of each, it baffled me. The food was still uneaten and the towels all rested at the bottom of the pool as well. I'm going to bed. I told the grinning fool who was my cousin. Sleep with one eye open, cousin, and your hand on your gun. She may just kill you tonight, Declan said as I walked back to the room I was given for the night. When I entered, there sat my reinforced steel cuffs in tiny paces all over my now shot-up bed. On top of that was a fucking note from hers truly, in her precise handwriting, with a bullet taped to it. I came to visit you, honey, so we could finish what we started in the basement. But you and your cousin were busy, giggling like schoolgirls. Oh, well, I hope you have a good night. About the bed, well, you can understand, right, sweetheart? Checkmate, Melody Giovanni. I could hear her laughter ringing in my fucking ears. Checkmate. She thought this was checkmate. We hadn't even started playing yet. Beaming. I jumped on the bullet-infested bed, kicking up feathers, before pulling out my phone and dialing quickly. Hello, mother. I'm sorry it's late. I was beginning to think you'd forgotten about me. I miss you all. The house is too quiet. I can't think. Oh, how's Melody? Is she beautiful? I met Orlando once and he was a looker, I'm sure. Yes, I've missed you as well. Yes, Melody is. She is one of a kind, ma. One of a kind. I was calling to say if you wouldn't mind having a welcoming party for her, just to show her how happy I am to have her in my life. Really? Someone sounds smitten. The whole family? I wanted to roll my eyes. Yes, the whole family. Can you do it? She is almost as maniacal as Olivia. Are you sure she isn't tired? 
I thought she just came into town today. She won't be tired at all. Sure, I'm so excited. I'll get right on it. When she hung up, I couldn't help but grin. My mother would do what she always did for celebrations. She would go over the top. I knew now Melody could lie down with the lowest and roll in the dirt like a motherfucking pro. But she wouldn't be able to contain herself with the family. They shit rainbows and unicorns. And while she was distracted, it would give me time to work on a new lead I had on the Bolero. I was planning something huge for those motherfuckers, and I was going to use the information I'd acquired from Orlando's files to do it. The Giovanni's contacts were now my contacts. I had almost wanted to say checkmate fucking now, but I wondered how she'd feel when I used her work and multiplied the destruction by twenty. She was playing childish games, and I was no child. This wasn't about who could outdo whom. This was me, proving a point. I would kill two birds with one stone. The Valero would never see it coming, and I would make my mark as the new Cana Canerta and boss. Sleep tight, my little Giovanni, for tomorrow you'll dance like my very own puppet on strings. I thought, lifting my hand behind my head and grinning.